Welcome back to That Chain Show. I'm your host, Jason Little. It's a beautiful fall day up here in the Great White North. I went out for a walk this morning thinking about this episode and uh, decided to do a little bit of a different format. So if you are watching this on the YouTube channel, obviously you'll see the environment is a little bit different. If you're listening on your favorite podcast listener thingamajiggy, then you don't have to worry about saying that I look unprofessional because I'm wearing a hoodie and wearing a hat. Anyway, let's get right into the episode. So this one is about building change capability and it was inspired by a comment from Aaron Scholes on a post that I put on LinkedIn a little while ago. So again, if you are listening to this, you'll miss out on some of the visuals I'm gonna show. So make sure to head over to our YouTube channel. You can find the links in the show notes and then you can check out some of the things I'm gonna show. So I put a post out there about uh, why your change comms suck and what you can do about it. So the basic premise is when we talk about change communications in the traditional sense, often it manifests itself in broadcasting. So, you know, we'll blast information out in a newsletter, we'll do scripted town halls where the the questions are scripted so the leaders can be seen answering certain types of questions, that type of stuff. So if you flip your thinking away from that broadcasting style communications and more towards meaningful dialogue, you're more likely to get people involved and interested because you're actually listening to what their concerns are and you're not just filtering it through a lens or just trying to communicate things out for optics sake. Anyway, the question from Aaron, I'll put this up on the screen. I won't read through the whole thing for those listening on the podcast, but the gist of it was if you've got 90,000 people in the organization across 3,000 locations and you have no direct access to like 99% of those people, how would lean change management deal with that approach? So I guess, you know, my my stock answer to a question like this is, I don't know, find a different job (laughs) or good luck. I mean, if you think you need to change 90,000 people at the same time across that many locations and you don't have access to any of them, what are you supposed to do? It's not like what we do is magic, but I get what the gist of the question was. So instead of just kind of answering it, I thought I would do a little survey. So I put a poll up on LinkedIn and asked people, um, I first I had them uh, break down the role. So I wanted to see if there was a different perspective between say agile coaches and uh, traditional change managers. So some of the filters were uh, choosing Are you an executive, so VP or up? Um, Middle manager, so anybody who's a manager up until, say, senior director. Um, Employees, so team members, uh, team leads, anybody kind of individual contributors, as they're called in the HR world, which is, I don't know how I feel about that term. Anyway, consultants, so you're an independent change consultant. You either work for yourself or you work for a firm and you're hired to do change for organizations. Agile coaches. And I wanted to separate Agile coaches out because I wanted to see if there was a difference of, difference of perspective because Agile coaches are kind of discovering change stuff. You can see it all over the place. All the Agile frameworks, methods, tools, people have been kind of latching on to, oh, it's really all about change. And from the change management side, it's been kind of the opposite. Oh, there's all this Agile stuff that we can use. So both audiences, I think, are coming from the same intent and want the same things. They just express themselves differently. So um, I guess as an example, uh, I was in Melbourne a number of years ago. And on one night, there was a traditional change management meetup. I think it was the I think it was the Change Management Institute that was hosting it, I can't remember. And on the the second night, there was an Agile coaching meetup and they were basically, you know, uh, two buildings apart. And um, I obviously went to both. And because I've had kind of a foot in both camps for the last 15 years or so, I knew a bunch of people on both on both sides, which is not a really good way to say it, I guess. And I wanted to cross pollinate because I think both, um, sides are again coming from the same intent and want the same things they express themselves differently the cool thing about that was in the change management meeting it was like oh these agile coaches come in and disrupt things and they don't know how to do change and they just shake things up and they make our lives so difficult blah 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 and on the agile coaching one it was basically the opposite it was all oh, those stodgy old change managers they don't know how to do anything they don't have the agile mindset they don't do this that and the other and when we got everybody together they went oh We do want the same things. So how can we learn from each other? Which that was kind of the whole point. 
So the reason why, that's the long answer to why I separated those questions out. I wanted to see what the perspective was between the two different groups. And then there was another category because uh, people might not identify with any of those um, groups. So again, if you're watching this on YouTube, you're gonna see these, these results on the screen. So first I'm gonna get into the survey results. This is kind of how I'll break down the episode. I'll show some highlights. So if you are listening to this in the podcast, I'll read out some highlights from some of the quotes, but you won't see the whole thing because some people typed in some pretty long answers to some of these things. And then I'll get into what my thoughts are for that question. And I'm doing this live and unscripted. It's early on Sunday morning. I went out for a walk, so I'll try not to ramble too much. So let's get into it. So first of all, uh, the poll's been up for a few days and uh, 24 people answered. So we ended up getting eight people. So 33% were middle managers. Um, I would argue 14% were, so 10, so 10, 14 people changed consultants-ish because out of those 14, four said other. And then in the comments, they put fancy titles like changeologist and and this kind of stuff. So I'm going to lump those two into the same category and only two agile coaches. So obviously not a whole lot of data. So if you're a stats person, you're probably screaming at your screen or your podcast thingy right now going, ah, it's not scientific enough. Um, But not the point. It was designed to be a straw human poll just to give me some input um, for this particular episode. So uh, you can see some of the roles on the screen. We've had uh, OCM practitioner slash changeologist, change manager in HR, internal leadership coach, and change advisor were some of the other categories. And the interesting thing was no executives, obviously. I did post this on LinkedIn. um, And no employees, obviously. So the reasons why I think there were no responses there is because neither of those groups really care. They've got day jobs. It's kind of like saying, as change people, we think everyone else should know and understand how to do change, to build change capability. That would be kind of like saying every change person needs to know how to do all the roles of the people they're coaching. For me, anyway. Kind of doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, And possibly, if you look at LinkedIn, it's all coaches and consultants. I think it's very rare that you actually get a you know, somebody on a team who's going to LinkedIn to post and comment on stuff. It's all people selling their stuff and posting blogs and stuff like that. So that could be one of the reasons. Anyway, so let's get into um, some of the responses. If you were to tweet out what change capability is, what would you say? And the gist of a lot of these was giving people the tools and the mental models they need so they can do change. So they have a little bit of information about how change works, how to facilitate change, how to swap their mindsets, stuff like that, how to embrace change. That was a theme from a lot of the comments. Um, There were a couple of really, really interesting ones. Um, How do you uncover what change means for different people and create an environment where everybody can contribute and figure out how to get there? That was an interesting one. Um, There were a couple uh, really short, punchy ones that I think make a lot of sense. A common language and understanding of how to enable successful change in yourself and others. That's a pretty interesting one. How to prepare individual, how prepared individuals are to lead themselves and others through change. And kind of the list goes on and on. There was one really giant, comment here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, Um, (laughs) except for the first line, because it's interesting. A true change capability means a trained change management resource doesn't need to be present for change to be successful. So just the fact that, you know, if agile people read that word resource that you're referring to a human as resource and ah, they get a little bit nuts. So um, the interesting thing was just the overall theme for the answers to that question. Uh, This one was particularly terrifying. The ability to drive change through people in a fractal way in an organization. I'm like, (laughs) my my brain went to a mental image of a vampire now because it's, you know, we're getting close to Halloween, but, you know, driving the stake through the heart of the vampire, you're driving change through people. So that was mildly terrifying. But there was some uh, pretty good and insightful information um, about 
if you had to tweet out what change capability is, what would you say? And I would say more so all of the responses were pretty much aligned with the same thing. Normal people need a little bit of information about how to do change. And when I say normal people, I mean people who are in the in the two roles that didn't answer this survey because they probably don't care. They should know and care a little bit because they're going to be the ones that actually make or break the change, not us as the change people. The other question was just a kind of thumb in the air from zero to a hundred. How I think building change capability with everyone in the organization is the best way to ensure successful change. And that had a, an average score of 84. So 84, um, uh, out of a hundred uh, s- thought that that was the right thing to do. Now the interesting part is when you filter those out and again there wasn't too much information here or sorry not not too many responses um, but a couple of interesting ones is the highest score I'm gonna filter these just kinda live here if I filter these by role and I filter by agile coaches Agile coaches had uh, 93. So on a scale of 100, they, they, the average was 93. Um, and the actual responses from each one, one person put 100 out of 100, most important thing ever. And the other one put 86. So that was the highest one. I thought it actually would have been opposite. I thought it would have been the change managers who would have had the highest score. Theirs was about uh, 10 points lower than that. So if I filter these by um, other and consultant, their score was 81. And the responses were a little more varied. There was there was one zero, which dragged it down. And again, if you're a stats person, you're probably screaming uh, right now, but Like I said, the whole point was to make it a straw human pull, but most of them were pretty high. There was one zero, there was a few 100s, and then everywhere in between. So the median, just looking at the median, was probably 75. Um, But I actually thought those overall scores would have been a lot higher. And if I filter this again by middle managers, middle managers was actually a little bit higher so than the change folks. So it was right in the middle with an 88. And the responses, lots of hundreds, a couple of 60s. So the median probably, yeah, median would be 75 again on this one. But so all the scores were, were relatively close and the answers, no matter what the role was for the tweet, was pretty similar. And it does get a little bit different when I say, now, why did you give the score that you gave? Uh, I'm not going to read through this gigantic comment that that I'm staring at right now. Um, Some of the ones from the middle managers were because everybody has a role in advocating for change. Leaders of people need some degree of capability in change. Successful change requires everyone and cannot be managed by a lone change agent or top-down directives. and one of the lower scores was everyone in quotes is a bit of a is a is a bit of a leading absolute and i don't think everyone needs to increase their capability nor that it's required for a successful change but everyone should have the option to improve their capability if they choose to be it an individual team or division and another low score for middle managers was i can't change you only you can change you I can help you on the journey by sharing why, information, tools, and support, but the journey is and must be yours. Now, my confirmation bias was off the charts for that comment because I have a very similar uh, attitude and stance towards it. There's nothing we can do. I'm not going to say nothing because I never speak in absolutes. Did you catch it? Um, I, I, I would share a similar thing. Um, I saw someone speak at an entrepreneur conference and she said something like, invite people to the party, ask them to dance, but let them opt out. And I think that is a healthy attitude that change agents should adopt for this. I can do my best to help, but I'm not the one doing the work. I remember I had a, uh, um, a call with a potential client there was, I don't know, three or four of them on the phone. They wanted to do some agile stuff and they wanted to hire an, an agile coach to do that. And the question they asked me was, so after we do the training and you come in and do some coaching, 
how can you ensure that those people follow what it is you were telling them? And I said, well, I can't. I mean, if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. That's just the way it goes. So we can do our best, but the alternative is we should figure out that this is the right change at the right time and people actually want to do this. Because if it's just all y'all as the managers who want those other people to do it, we've got to deal with that 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 gap of understanding between them before we even get started. Um, and there was a bit of a silence and then they said, oh, um, well, let us rethink what it is that we want to do. We'll call you back later, bye, click. And they hung up and I never heard from them again. So it's understandable that people want that. They want, um, they want certainty where certainty cannot exist. It's impossible to know how a change is going to work out, but it sucks a lot of the times. It's, you know, are you going to, if you're going to hire a consultant on a three month project to do change, who's going to be paying for that? Are you going to get your money's worth and how would you know? We want some level of certainty before we uh, partake in, in these changes. One organization I did some work with, I, and I wish they would have did this because it would have made such an awesome story, but they actually asked me, how would we know that you've been effective here? And I said, well, why don't you just, you know, in the lobby, this was pre-COVID, so everybody was in the office. Um, I said, in the lobby, just put up a big poster that says, you know, here's how much we're paying this idiot consultant. And do you feel you're getting your money's worth and put a scale from zero to a hundred and let people put a sticky note on there anywhere on that continuum with a comment. Why? And I said, that's the ultimate flattery. If people think it's valuable early on for these types of engagements, awesome. Because the, the lagging indicators, it's going to take a while. It's not like you're going to have a coach come in for a month, an agile coach or a process consultant or whatever, and you're magically going to see results right away. You're going to see them later on, probably when that consultant or coach is gone. So I thought it would be really cool to do that because a lot of the times early in change, it is feel. It's, do we think we're going in the right direction? Here's the assumptions we had about this, about this change or what it is that we want to do. And thumb in the air. Do we think we're going in the right direction? Yes, no, maybe. With a bunch of other data that says, if we don't think we're headed in the right direction, why? What's the evidence? And what do we want to do about it? So that for me, that's how you that's, that's an adaptive approach to change. And that's exactly what lean change is. So I think I am rambling a little bit. I'm, I'm going to publish all these raw answers um, up on the up somewhere. So you'll find them in the show notes where you can find them and you can filter them however you want. And you can take a look at any of this stuff. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to get into um, Aaron's question here and talk about this because after he had asked this question, actually, um, I attended a couple of Lean Coffee sessions. So one for um, um, uh, Jorge Ulson, who's a facilitator in, um, in South America, and uh, Justin Belaski, who's a facilitator up here in Canada, and, um, and Jorge's in Chile. Sorry, my brain rebooted. And typically I'll join the last session of a training course just to um, do a Lean Coffee, basically, with folks. And this exact same question popped up on both. And it kind of led to um, scale. How do we do change at scale? And how does lean change management solve that problem? And like I said in the beginning, the stock answer is if we build change capability, that's the best way to do it. And I would say my opinion is I mildly agree with the direction that question takes you. But like everything else on LinkedIn and Twitter and all this stuff, it's kind of one of those nonsense, easy answers that it sounds good. It's going to get you a gazillion likes. Everyone's going to retweet or reshare whatever. It's like, yay, let's embrace uncertainty and build change capability. And you go back to your day job at you know 9 a.m. on Monday and you're like, what the hell am I supposed to do now? So how do we make that real? My answer to those scaling questions, number one, um, it, the likelihood that all 90,000 people need to change in the same way at the same time. And they're all affected at the same intensities is zero. Now, some people might say, well, what if your change is a global HR change and it's changing something for everybody? Um, 
sure, that, that's a valid comment. Still, it's not going to affect everybody at the same time in the same way. Let's take a policy like dress code, for example. Let's just say for some crazy reason, a 90,000 person organization uh, just decided that everybody has to wear blue pants and a red shirt to work. That's our new dress code, effective Monday. So, okay, that affects everybody all at the same time. Is that, first of all, is that a realistic change? No. Is any global HR policy change happening for everybody at the same time? In my experience, no. And I've worked with, I actually did some work with one organization that has 400,000 employees worldwide. And they were rolling out a global HR change, but they were smart enough to know that obviously things will be a little bit different from region to region. So the way their organizational structure was set up is the mothership would decide on whatever this policy or this change was, and then all of the individual cells worldwide would kind of tweak it for their environment and for their culture and for their location and for the type of work. So if it was the manufacturing people versus the software development people or the sales people or whatever it was. So yes, it might've been a global change, but it's not like you have to steamroll everybody with the same thing at the same time. It's just, it's never gonna happen. Breaking, so, you know, how does lean change management do with, deal with that? And I like to give the example of a multinational that I worked with where we had, um, uh, what was it, the 65 countries, multiple subsidiaries, and you could say that the way their organizational structure was set up, they basically had five global divisions, if you will, and each of those five divisions had a managing director that was responsible for everything within that particular division. So the way we had set it up, and I'm gonna dig the picture up here live uh, on screen while I'm going through this, was we had kind of a central change team. Here's the picture. So if you're missing this, uh, basically, if you're listening to this on the podcast, then it's, it's basically a mind map that is a hub and spoke design. So in the center was our global uh, change team. I don't think they had a fancy name like Change Center of Excellence or kind of any of this stuff. It was basically just uh, two people and myself that were kind of in this center support group. And our stance was more like, um, uh, if you remember or if you've seen pictures of kind of the old um, patch system they used to use for patching phone calls. Um, operators, telephone operators, and you're just kind of, you're there in a central way and you're trying to connect things. So that's, that's really what our stance was. Or like air traffic controller, I use that a lot. So uh, the air traffic controller, they're at the top of the tower, they can see everything, they're trying to orchestrate and coordinate, but they don't have direct control over any of that stuff. So that was the mental model we were using for it. And the gist of this model was we would have uh, a change person, and one of the managing directors would be kind of pair coaching, if you want to call it that, or they'd be stapled to each other somehow. So you'd have somebody who was knowledgeable in change, somebody who's knowledgeable in the business. They would kind of work together, and then our central support group would actually connect those five together somehow. Then we had our second order and our third order change agents. And the way we set it up is uh, we spent two days in Vienna having a liftoff, we brought all of the different change cells from all the different companies to that location, and we agreed that we're not a team, number one. We're not a global change team because it's so different from region to region. The folks in the UK have their way of doing things. The folks in Spain had their way. The folks in China had their way. And what we have tried to coalesce around was how do we build a support structure due to the scale? So we did a couple of uh, vision exercises where we were trying to figure out, you know, are we a team or not a team? And like I said, we agreed at the end of it, we're not a team. We're, we're a cluster of teams that the central kind of um, uh, change support group would try to connect with each other. So we did a comfy couch session and we had the folks from the UK were talking about how they do change. And they said, well, we're managers in manufacturing here. We don't think there is a list of roles and responsibilities for us in this change thing that we're talking about in this liftoff session. 
every Wednesday, we shut our mouths, we walk the floor, we listen to people. We, we go to their daily huddles or daily stand-ups, um, and it's in manufacturing. And no, they weren't applying Agile to that. I mean, my dad was a welder for 40 years, and they did a stand-up every day, you know, since the, the early 70s. So it's just a good thing to do. But anyway, their stance was, that's our job. Our job is to walk around, ask people, be aware of problems, and then figure out how to fix them for people. So we just think change is natural in, in our particular role. The folks in Germany had the opposite impression. They were like, we need all of the roles and responsibilities, what you would kind of expect from your stereotypical, you know, uh, Germans needing uh, order and structure type of thing. And you can't cancel me for that because there is, uh, uh, um, my mom's German, so we, I have a German background, so I'm allowed to say that. Plus, I've been to Germany, I don't know, like 50 times. Um, but the point of that is, all of these groups had their own mojo for how they do change. The folks in Spain, for example, you know, they'd take a seven-hour lunch, and then they would go to the beach and talk about change. And obviously, I'm exaggerating the stereotype. But the point was... If we could keep those individual groups connected to each other, they could share stories about what was working, and then those individual groups could decide whether or not they wanted to try it. So we did, I don't know, five, six lean coffee sessions or support sessions a month because some groups wanted to keep things private, and they didn't want the rest of the, the, the change group, as I'll call the entire global group, um, to know about some things. So we did one global one with everybody. We did one with just the change support team and then all the individual cells worldwide. Um, we would do just individual ones for them based on support. If they had a good story, they'd bring it back to the global one where we had everybody there and they'd share the story. And then, you know, maybe, maybe somebody in Spain tried a change canvas or they tried a perspective map or they tried this tool or that tool and it worked really well. Then the folks in Germany would go, cool, can we chat afterwards? Can you show us what you did? Can you show us the canvas if there's no confidential prob confidentiality problems with it? Maybe we can try it too. So to get back to the question, how do you transform that many people when you don't have access to the people? You have to do it with cells and layers. You have to do it in, I'm not gonna say have to, that's, that's wrong because remember, I never talk in absolutes. Um, you have to, <laughs> I just did it again, geez. You, it would be a good idea to organize in a hub and spoke networked design as opposed to a hierarchical structure because of the fluidity of change. And it, I mean, we modeled this for maybe a month or so back and forth of meetings and sessions to try to figure out what's the right way to do it. And uh, I supported that group for about a year. So did we build change capability? With some people, yes. Uh, I was doing some of the work with um, one of the local companies here uh, around the Toronto area where I'm based, and they were in manufacturing. So, uh, well, they were a manufacturing cell, basically. And I remember the change program that they were working on was, I think a typical, like what you would typically see, we need to lower costs, we need to increase quality. It's a common one in, in manufacturing from companies I've worked with. And uh, the lead foreman had retired. And the lead foreman was the person who was taking the lead on this, this change stuff, essentially. So someone new came in, more or less right out of school, so young. And I remember talking to the leaders there about, you know, how do we make sure that everybody else listens to this new person who's now responsible for driving the change. And I've done roofing work, I've done manufacturing work, so if I had to put those in buckets, you could say white collar versus blue collar. I don't like to do those types of things, but just to paint a picture in your mind. So I know how those, thing, those environments work. And I said, honestly, the best thing that this person could do is take the whole crew out for beers after work because they are the outsider. And I think this is true of any situation. When any outsider comes in, the first thing they need to do is prove their capability and prove their worth. Um, 
the worst thing that you could possibly do as an outsider is come in and pretend you know everything and try to get people on board for stuff. It'll never happen. Um, at its worst, you're going to get malicious compliance where, oh, they're the leader, I just have to follow them. And uh, at best, maybe you'll get one or two people that are kind of, um, I, I would say, you know, my dad would fit, would fit that mold because when he's with the guys, they trash the engineers. Uh, they've probably never even picked up a blowtorch their whole life and, rah, 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 and all that stuff. But he was the bridge builder. Like he was the one that knew that because of his standing and because the, the, the crew all listened to him, he had to translate and convey the stuff that the engineers wanted to get done. So he was smart enough to know that he, he had kind of, kind of had to sit in the middle and be the bridge between those two different groups. So I told these folks, I said, it's the same for this guy. Like he's really got to come in and observe, ask questions, take them out for beers, get his hands dirty, build cre credibility, then hopefully they'll listen to them. But if you have a deadline and a schedule for when you want these changes done and this person comes in and they push, more likely, it's more likely you're going to get the opposite effect. So when we talk about this building change capability, um, I think I'm rambling a little bit, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up this episode. How does lean change management deal with scale and with that problem? It's building networks. It's knowing that you as the change person, so if you're in the central change COE or the, the change management department, the OCM department, whatever, if you're in that group, taking the stance of being a service function, not a control function. So you're not there to create the change framework, to define the change up front, to communicate it out and steamroller the organization with it. You are there to support the organization through change, which means educating upwards to really um, educate leaders on how change at scale works. And it works very, very slowly. And it's different from office to office, from country to country. The underlying thing that is common is doesn't matter what country, language, culture you're from, change is change. People are very similar in that sense, but it will manifest itself differently for different regions. So be a support function and recognize that there are going to be some cultures that are more top-down command control driven where the social structures are more hierarchical by nature. So they will tend to respond to change being dropped through the hole in the floor. So they need to take a different approach maybe with, with their particular cell or location. And the opposite will be true for other locations. You're going to have other um, cultures in different countries that are more co-creative by nature. And you can get away with bringing people on board and maybe building more change capability in that area. So create a contextualized approach. Create, have enough tools, methods, ideas, and structures in place that's going to support people to be able to build an approach in their location or the region that's most likely to work with that culture instead of standardizing it. And that and that's obviously harder on the change team because you need to really have your stuff together. You really need to have a very broad toolkit and ideas and a coaching background. You need to be able to ask good questions. You need to understand the cultural differences, especially in global organizations. So I've done a lot of work with Nordic uh, countries and generally speaking, from my experience, they're fantastic at change because of their social structures. And there's other places in the world where it's totally opposite. It's going to follow the social structure. So it's going to follow a hierarchical kind of approach versus co-creative. So take the time to understand that. Build a cell structure and network structured support environment for all of your change agents. And through that process, connect these different groups together so they can share stories and they can apply what's working in one area and give another area or another location another set of ideas that they might want to try. So that's the way we dealt with it here. That's the way I generally deal with it when I'm working with larger organizations. But uh, to close off, as far as building change capability, my opinion is yes and. It's a good idea but let's not just keep whacking people over the head 
with build, we, we need to build change capability. Let's get more specific about what it is that we actually need to do. Because these easy answers that are gonna get you lots of likes and lots of clicks, they sound good. And you can see from the survey results, a lot of the, most people vastly agreed with that's the best approach for change. But I'd ask yourself this question as the change person, how much should you get invested and involved in the tools and skills that everybody else has in the organization and their functions? You know, how much of a leadership expert should you be? How much should you know about software development and design if you're a change agent working on project-based change and a big software rollout? Well, you should understand how this works. It's impossible. We can't all be experts in everything. People on teams can't become change experts. Where you'll find the benefit, say on software teams or, or any um, individual contributor, if you want to call it that, is the folks that have social capital are the people who are going to help you spread the change if they think it's a good idea. So leveraging the movers, building cell structures, having a good support system in place, and uh, ma definitely managing upwards to help people and leaders and stakeholders understand that it's a lot more complex than coming up with a nice plan and then steamrolling the organization with it. So that's it for this episode. This was a lot longer than I had wanted. So if you are still listening, thank you so much for sticking around. Again, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit like and subscribe. You'll get notified when new episodes comes out. And if you're listening in your podcast listener thingamajiggy, you can go to thatchangeshow.com. You can find the show notes and links to all the stuff and uh, that, that I was mentioning here and the YouTube channel if you want to see some of the visuals. And that's it for this week. I'm Jason Little, your host of That Change Show, and I'll see you next time.